thank you for what you do. And uh, they have a unique ministry that not everybody is gifted for, and it's so important to uh, have that support system when you're on the field by yourself, and uh, that is so important what Jim and Sabeth to do. So we appreciate that very much. Well, it's that time of year. People uh, that are here for the winter are uh, starting to pack their bags, pack that car, get ready for that journey back to the frozen tundra. (laughs) Journeys. In fact, I had a couple this morning said that they were all, told me last week they weren't going to be here this week. They they were here and she said, well, we all packed yesterday, had the car packed, put the cat in the back seat. And somehow the back, the, the back window got down and the cat jumped out of the window and they hadn't seen the cat since. So they delayed their trip uh, hoping that their cat will return home. And I said, well, your cat's just smarter than you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cat go home or to go back north. But uh, I want us to think about journeys today. We've, we've all... For those of you that might be traveling this week or in the, the, the days or weeks to come, you know it's going to be busy. You know it's going to be crowded. You know it's going to be, and journeys can be full of all kinds of ups and downs. A journey can start off great. You can be having a great time, and then all of a sudden you hear a pop, and you have a flat tire along the way. And all of a sudden what was going to be a great journey turned into a not so great journey and you had to stop and do that. And you might go along the way and you might have the other extreme. You may get to stop and see some friends that you haven't seen for a long time and you'll visit with them and have a great time with them. Journeys are full of sometimes unexpected things, sometimes very expected things, sometimes they're full of pleasant surprises. But this morning I want us to all think about journeys. Not just a journey back up north on the road or a journey to go on vacation or something like that. I want us to think what we call the journey of life. That journey happens to all of us. And there's all kinds of things that come along the way. And there's all kinds of challenges and all types of things that we plan for and some things we don't plan for. How are we doing on that journey? What is the ultimate goal? Where is it that we hope to end up at the end of the journey? This morning as the kids came in, as the choir sang, by the way, the choir is going to be singing this Friday night for our Good Friday service. And uh, really the best choir I've ever heard here at Anchor. Uh, So I hope you'll come for our Good Friday service, get the details in the bulletin. And as the kids came in, they swinging. The palm branches. Palm Sunday. You've heard the story many times before. The day that Christ entered in Jerusalem. That final journey that He made. And I want us to think about that journey. I want us to hear that journey. I want us to also then learn some things for our own journey that we experience. What preceded the journey? We don't think about that much. It's usually picked up with the palm branches and the Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. But it wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment deal. Jesus just didn't wake up that morning and say, Well, I don't have anything on my calendar. I think I'll go to Jerusalem today. No, it was something. In fact, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. I wanted you to trace with me the events leading to the journey. The mindset which Christ had. How much He knew about that journey. In Matthew chapter 16, following the great passage where Jesus has said to His disciples, Hey gang, what are they saying about me out there? Who are people saying? What are they saying about who I am? And Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're, you're one of the prophets. And then Peter steps up and says, Oh, but you are the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus says, You're right, Peter. And upon that I will build my church. And then He goes on to tell them something that one day He must go and, and be killed began to you know, debate and say, oh, no, 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 that, that can't happen. And that's when Peter received a message from Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Well, it's in that context, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, we find these words, and it kind of marks the beginning of this journey to the cross. From then on, Jesus began to tell His disciples plainly that He had to go to Jerusalem. And he told them what would happen to them there. He would suffer at the hands of the leaders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed and would be raised on the third day. 
So way back in chapter 16, Jesus is saying to His disciples, notice He says, spoke to them plainly. There were times He spoke in parables. He'd talk about seeds and dirt and growing and all this, and the disciples came up scratching their head and said, Jesus, what in the world was that all about? And then Jesus would have to explain to them, well, this means this and this means that. And, oh, okay, now I get it. But here in chapter 16, it says that Jesus began to speak to them plainly. He wanted them to understand. He told them clearly that he must go to Jerusalem and that he would be killed there and then raised from the dead. Well, in chapter 17, in another occasion in verse 22, he gets a little bit more detail. He says, one day after they returned to Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He will be killed. And three days later, He'll be raised from the dead. And the disciples' hearts were filled with grief. He gives another little detail. He says, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm not just going to be killed. I'm going to be betrayed. And then in chapter 20, he, goes, he zooms in a little bit more. And He says this in verse 17. As Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, He took the twelve privately and told them what was going to happen. So the journey has begun in chapter 20. They're on the way to Jerusalem. Somewhere what Elias says, guys, before we go any further, I want you to really understand. I've told you about this twice, but I really want you to hear what I'm saying here. And He says in verse 18, when we get to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and to the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence Him to die. Then they will hand Him over to the Romans to be mocked and whipped and crucified. But on the third day, He will be raised from the dead. You see, the, to me, the most important thing about Sunday is that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen and yet He still made the journey. If someone came up and you were going to go on a trip, and they said, you're going to start this trip out, and it's going to start like any normal trip, but then all oh, miles down the road, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have a flat tire. Oh, okay. Well, then it's a flat tire, you're going to get back in the car, and you're going to head down the road, and then you're going to run out of gas in the middle of nowhere. Oh, okay. Well, then someone's finally going to bring you some gas, you're going to go down the road a little bit further and you're going to hit this tremendous thunderstorm, rainstorm, wind. The traffic's going to be stopped. You know, you're going to have to sit there for hours waiting for the bad weather and you're finally going to get through that and then you're going to hit the border of Kentucky and Tennessee and you're going to be hit by a blizzard. <laughs> and you're going to have to stay there for weeks. <laughs> See you. Have a good time on your trip. <laughs> What would you do? I, I most of us say, well, I, I, I'm going to delay that trip. If that's going to happen, I'm not going there. Jesus knew he was going to be killed. Knew he was going to be betrayed by one of his followers. Knew he was going to be handed over to the religious leaders. Knew he was going to be whipped. Knew he was going to be flogged. Knew he was going to be mocked. And yet, what did he do? He went. He took the journey into Jerusalem. And I think that's significant. As we think about the journey of life, even though there's times that we might have a choice on a trip, we know there's going to be things in our future that we don't quite grasp on. We might not know exactly what along the way, but we're still on the journey. And Christ made the journey that day into Jerusalem. And we've heard the story. They brought out the palm branches like our kids did. And they waved the palm branches. Why palm branches? Because in those days when a king would enter into a city, that's what they would do. It's a type of homage, a type of honoring him. And then Jesus entered in Jerusalem and taught. I want to kind of go to the end of that journey. We see the journey ended in the eyes of many not so well. Just from a purely human standpoint, what happened to Christ that week was not a good thing. It's recorded in all the Gospels. I want to read you an account in the Gospel of Mark. Mark 
verses 21 through 20, uh, 21 and following, we find these words. As a passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. Simon was the father of Alexander Rufus. Now let me just kind of set the scene. This when Jesus is carrying the cross, he's been arrested, he's been at a trial, he's been mocked, he's been whipped, he's been beaten, and now he is down under the weight of the cross. And the Roman soldiers see that he's not going to make the whole journey. And they grab this guy out of the crowd and said, you carry us. So that's what's happening. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine drugged with myrrh and he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. And it was nine o'clock in the morning when they, were, when they crucified him. And a sign was fastened to the cross announcing the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. And two thieves or revolutionaries were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now! They yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from that cross. And the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law also mocked Jesus. Ah, he saved others. They scoffed. But he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down so we can see it and believe him. And even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. At noon, darkness across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Eli. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, then. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in the front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died... He said, Surely this man was the Son of God. And as the people gathered that moment, they thought the journey had ended. But it doesn't. We'll talk about that next week. In this series, three things that changed the world. Last week we looked at the first thing. The first thing was the birth of Christ. The second thing today is the journey to the cross and what happened on the cross. Changed the direction and the destiny of mankind. That journey was an amazing journey. That event was an amazing event. And I want us to think about that journey and what Christ went through in light of our journey. The journey that you're on right now. Wherever you find yourself on that path. How's your journey going? What can you learn from the journey of Christ? Let me just share a couple of things with you. And the first is simply this. The journey can bring new meaning in your life. The journey can bring new meaning. You see... Even on a very familiar journey, that's what Jesus was on. That journey to Jerusalem, that that was not the first time he had made that track. Actually, from a young boy, he had probably gone that same road, that same path. He knew all the places to stop. He knew all the watering holes. He knew where he could get food. It was a very familiar journey. Maybe you've traveled a road many times over. Time and time again. When I was in, went to college, I uh, uh, lived in southern Indiana, right near Bloomington, Indiana. Went to school in Lincoln, Illinois. It's about 250 miles, just a little northwest of there. And my freshman year, 
I drove that route back and forth about every other weekend. Now I had a I'd started dating this cute little girl in high school. And uh, thought, how can I get along without her? So every other weekend, I would drive home and it paid off because now she's my wife. All right? I got her young and brought her up right. That's what I tell everybody. <laughs> But literally, I would leave on Friday afternoon, and I'd get in the car at Lincoln, and I won't give you the route, but I could still tell you the routes and the names of the towns you'd go through in order, and the highways, and the places to stop along the way. And I'd get up, and I would leave at 6 o'clock on Monday mornings to drive back up to Lincoln, because I had 11 o'clock class. And uh, there were days that, that I'd go, I know at least you know, 50 or 60 miles, and I'd just kind of shake myself and said, I don't remember at all the last 50 or 60 miles. You know, I just knew that journey so well. And sometimes when we get so accustomed to journeys, we just kind of don't see the things there. You know, that same thing can happen in our Christian journey if we're, if we're not careful. We can find ourselves going through the motions. We can find ourselves doing the same things. And it gets so accustomed, so routine, that we just go through and do the things without giving them any thought or any, you know, meaning. You just go through the motions. That journey for Jesus took on new meaning that day. In Zechariah chapter 9, we hear these words of prophecy. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, on a foal of a donkey. You see, there was something new that day. There was something special that day. Jesus had entered in Jerusalem before, but never had the people come out with palm branches and greeted Him as king. Because that day he came riding on a colt, the mark of a king entering in to his city. And the people reacted. And it wasn't just a reaction. It was a part of God's plan. And as they gathered together, there was new meaning that day because it marked the beginning of the final journey for Christ on this cross. Don't let familiarity with your Christian walk ever become routine. Look for that which is new and look at that which is fresh. Do that which brings you new challenges. Don't get stuck in a rut. You know, if I was to look at the final years of my ministry up in Springfield, Illinois, I'd been there for 28 years. And probably the last two years there, I just really wrestled with, you know, what is it, God, you want me to do? I'd been there for a while, and some people thought, well, you're just going to stay here to retire, and, and now that really wasn't part of it. Yeah, I, I just, that didn't appeal to me. And I really began praying and wrestling with that. And to make a long story short, got a call from the church here, and, and here I am. It's been a new journey. It's been the same thing as far as it's been ministry, preaching and doing all those things. But there was something new. There's something fresh about that. And, and I've enjoyed that journey. I've enjoyed this part of the journey. Even though it's the same thing, it's become very fresh and it's become new. And there's always new challenges. And, and uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been great to be a part of that. I don't know what it is for you in your life. It may not be you obviously changing from one ministry or not, but it may be changing for something that you do in your walk with Christ. It may be trying something that you've never tried before. It may be getting involved in a ministry that you've never done before. It may be finally sharing your faith with that person that you've been concerned about and you've thought about doing. It may be trying um, to uh, do a particular specific area of ministry that you've never done. Whatever it might be, the point is this. Don't let journey become so routine that it loses your, its meaning for your life. There is freshness in the Lord. There are always new challenges in front of us. As long as we're breathing and walking here on this earth, never let the journey become old. Let it always be fresh. Let it always be new. Maybe this Palm Sunday is the time where you can take up a familiar journey and begin a new journey in your life. So don't let the journey get stale. A journey can always find new meaning.
The second thing I think is important is that sometimes you need to allow your heart to be touched on the journey. The Jews, they were looking for a king that day. Their agenda was set. They were out. Here came their king. Hosanna, son of David. Come on in. Lead our kingdom. Lead us against Rome. We've got out. We're ready for you. What did Jesus do as he rode into Was he the typical politician? Did he jump the donkey and start shaking hands? Grab out of crowd and kissing them? Give everybody high fives. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. No, he didn't do that, did he? He rode on that donkey and we find where his heart was in Luke chapter 19. And this is what it says in verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. Why? Verse 43, that's what he said. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within its walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That journey broke Jesus' heart. And as he entered then, he wept. I wonder if the people with the palm branches along the path wondered why he was crying rather than smiling and high-fiving. It's because his heart was broken because the people still did not get it. He had healed the sick, caused the blind to see, fed them, walked on water. He had done all kinds of things. And yet they missed it. They were just looking for an earthly king. And he knew it went much deeper than that. His heart was broken. And it's okay to have our hearts be broken along the journey. In fact, it's good sometimes because it's too easy to become calloused. It's too easy to become apathetic. It's too easy to say, oh, well, someone else will take care of that. As we go on this journey of life, we need to have our hearts touched. Our mission is to be the hands, feet, and what? Heart of Jesus. That means seeing things through the eyes of Jesus. And responding the way Jesus responded. And sometimes that's just being broken hearted. And sometimes that's the beginning of a new journey for us. When we begin to see things differently. When you begin to see that person you've cared so much for in a little bit different light. Or especially when you see that person you haven't cared so much for. And you begin seeing them in a different light. On this journey, let your heart be broken. It's okay to weep. It's okay to be touched because of the needs of the people. That was the bottom line here. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and He knew what was going to happen to them. He's prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when Rome came in and totally encircled the the city and it became a very, very, very bad siege for those who lived in the city. His heart was broken. Allow your heart to be touched by the journey. Don't go along in such a way that says, I'm not going to let anything get to me. Because sometimes we need to let things get to us in order to have the heart of Jesus. One final thing. Our journey doesn't end at the cross. You see that day for those who were mocking Him, those who had arrested Him, those who were the Jewish leaders, they thought, finally we had gotten rid of Him. He's out of our minds, out of our hair. We don't have to worry about crowds following Him. Whew, fine, we're done here. But it didn't end there, did it? Because we know that three days later, just as what He told His disciples back in Matthew 16, Matthew 17, Matthew 20, each time He said, and on the third day I will raise from the dead. Our journey doesn't end at the cross. 
But along that journey, there's going to be times when we really need to focus on the cross. Because there's going to be times when others are going to try to derail you and get you off that journey. They're going to discourage you. They're going to do everything they can to get you on a different path. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a great chapter full of all the great examples. Listen to some of these things that we can learn. Don't let others derail you. Listen, Listen to this about Noah. It was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from a flood. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened before and by his faith he condemned the rest of the world and he was made right in God's sight do you think Noah was ever made fun of hey Noah what oh, what's a boat I got to get ready for the flood because it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights what's rain it never rained up to that point he was mocked and ridiculed And yet, in Hebrews 11, he was commended for his faith because he did not let others derail him. You need to trust God along the journey. Even when you don't have all the details. Verse 8 of Hebrews 11. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance place. And this is a crazy... He went without knowing where he was going. God just said, I want you to go to the land I'll show you. And then we'll worry about the details later. And Abraham packed it up and began his journey. And Abraham was commended for his faith because he trusted God along the way. He didn't see the end plan. He didn't see the final chapter. He didn't know what lay ahead. But he continued to trust in God. You see, we need to keep in mind the big picture in all of this. Hebrews chapter 13, 11 verse 13 says this. All this is kind of summarizing all these people that he's talked about. All these faithful ones died without what God had promised them but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed the promises of God what the writer of Hebrews is saying there these people kept on going they may not have received and seen everything they thought they were going to get here on this earth but they kept the big picture in mind and then they received their reward after they left this earth and they're commended for their faith because they always kept their eyes on the end goal The conclusion of Hebrews 11 is found actually in chapter 12. And it's a great way to wrap all this up because here's what the writer says about all these people of faith, about all the journeys which they went on. What was it that kept them going? And what is it that keeps us going? This is what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin which so easily entangles us, And let us run with perseverance the race that God has set before us. How do you do that? How do you strip that off? How do you run with perseverance? He tells us in verse 2, he says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. He was willing to die a shameful death. Where? On the cross. Because of the joy he knew that would be his afterwards. Our journey doesn't end at the cross and that the final event was the death of Christ. Our journey continues on, but we must always keep focused on the cross. And it's when we keep focused on the cross that we can continue to remain faithful from start to finish. So how's your journey going? Where are you at in life? What are you going to do to keep it fresh? What are you going to do to keep it focused on the right things? God calls us to remain faithful unto death so that He will grant us the crown of life. Let's all do the journey well. Let's have a good trip. Let's finish together. Let's pray.